Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I'm Nicolas Veron. It's my pleasure to start this uh, new session of the financial statement series at the Peterson Institute. And today we're we will be talking about money laundering and uh, policies against money laundering, uh, so-called AML, anti-money laundering supervision and other regulatory and uh, oversight policies. Uh, it's a privilege to have for this discussion, Sean Berrigan and Josh Kirschenbaum. Sean Berrigan uh, is of course the Director General for Financial uh, Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union. I hope I got it probably not in the right order. Uh, DG FISMA at the European Commission, which does all uh, financial services uh, policy for the commission. Uh, Shen studied at University College Dublin. He got an MA there in economics in 1985. Then he, uh, actually before that and after that, he worked for a, a period in the Irish uh, government at the Department of uh, Industries, the Department of Energy, Department of Labor. Uh, and then in 1986, he joined the European Commission where he has been since, which if I count correctly, is more than 35 years with a one year interruption at the IMF, uh, which, um, uh, is a, a humbling experience for the rest of us. Uh, Shen started as the Agricultural uh, Directorate General and quickly joined the Directorate General for Economic and Monetary Affairs, uh, ECFIN, now DG ECFIN. And from 2000, he was at DG ECFIN uh, in charge of all the financial system and financial markets monitoring. So uh, it gives him a pretty unique combination in the Commission, maybe not uh, entirely unique, but very rare, which is of seeing uh, policy issues both from the side, from the macro side of economics and also from the financial system and financial market size, uh, side, which uh, is um, something I've learned to appreciate a lot over the years. Uh, Shen joined DG FISMA um, in 2014 when it was formed from part of the former DG internal market and uh, parts of ECFIN and other bits. And he has been the director general for uh, more than a year since the beginning of 2020. Uh, I mentioned he spent some time uh, at the IMF in the treasurer's department, uh, monitoring foreign exchange markets and financial markets. So that's, uh, that adds to the, the market savvy I was mentioning. Josh Kirschenbaum uh, studied at Northwestern University. He got his master's in international security at Georgetown. Uh, and then he worked in the U.S. Treasury Department for uh, a number of years from 2011 to 2019. He worked at uh, two offices, primarily the Office of Financial Assets Control, OFAC, which is in charge of enforcing sanctions, and then at the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, uh, which is specifically in charge of fighting uh, money laundering. And he was acting director uh, of the Office of Special Measures of FinCEN, and I'm not sure what the special measures are, but it sounds uh, pretty intimidating to an, an outsider like me. In 2018, uh, Josh uh, joined the German Marshall Fund, and specifically its uh, program called the Alliance for Securing Democracies. That's when we met, and I have to disclose here that we also became uh, co-authors at the time, so that uh, we, we may have a little bit too much convergence for comfort um, uh, during this session. In 2019, he also joined the private sector as a senior vice president of a regional bank based in Los Angeles called the Bank of Hope, in which he uh, is in, uh, in charge of the department that deals with Bank Secrecy Act and uh, OFAC uh, issues. So with that, um, over to you, Shen. I will, um, I think you have a couple of slides and actually I have them, so I will put them on my screen. Please let me know um, which slides to use and, um, and how to deal with them. Sorry if it takes me a minute or two, because uh, as usual, uh, I think I have them on the screen, but I don't, so, um, so it will take me uh, just, uh, a few seconds, you can already start. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, given the time differences, I'll just say hello to everybody. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Nicola, for the introduction, which has embarrassed me and made me feel old in equal measure. So um, thank you for that. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here on my part too. And, and I want to, I'm, I'm very happy to take the opportunity, let's say, to explain what the Commission is doing and by extension, what the EU is doing in the field of anti-money laundering and uh, countering the terrorism of finance, which I will refer to as AML uh, going forward. 
Uh, I have a few slides. I said probably more than I should have, but I will move through them quickly. Uh, they will be available even available now, I think, or afterwards anyway. And we can discuss in more detail what's on those slides uh, in the follow-up discussion. I think it's fair to say, as in the, the advertisement for the um, for the session, we've experienced a series of recent scandals in the EU relating to AML. Uh, a number of banks have been involved, and these cases. They have revealed kind of important deficiencies in supervision and uh, a lack of appropriate structures to coordinate both supervised reactions and uh, financial intelligence. We in the Commission undertook a, a post-mortem uh, in 2019 and all of these deficiencies were fairly clearly documented and they resulted in an action plan. This is how the Commission does things. We, uh, we do post-mortem, we do an action plan then, which laid out where we thought we needed to go in 2020. The member states endorsed that action plan and they also outlined their views uh, in a set of kind of conclusions shortly afterwards. So now in, uh, in July last, we, the Commission delivered on the action plan with the adoption of this AML package. And the objective of the package is to sort of reinforce AML arrangements in the EU by, uh, in, in three ways. We want to establish a single rule book where appropriate we want to set up an EU level supervisor and we want to provide a coordination and support mechanism for financial in intelligence units or FIUs. Kind of technically speaking, the package comprises four legislative acts or proposals for four legislative acts. There is a regulation and a directive which will take care of the sort of general rules for AML. There is a regulation which deals with one specific aspect, which is the transfer of funds in relation to crypto asset uh, services providers. And then there's a regulation which sets up or proposes to set up the anti-money laundering authority at the EU level. Now, in many ways, this package parallels a similar package we did for banking after the great financial crisis. I mean, there we took a, the same sort of ambitious approach towards banking supervision at EU level. We did that based on more harmonized rules. So again, we combined regulations and directives we, and we centralized oversight, not at the EU level, but at the Euro area level in that case, in the form of the, the single supervisory mechanism. We think, and I think others agree, this has paid off. Banks are better supervised now and they're accordingly more robust. So we're putting our faith in this formula um, this time around as well. So the package that we're doing on AML has similar elements, it has similar levels of ambition, but we're not simply replicating the, the, the bank supervisory model of the SSM because banking supervision and AML supervision, quite different things. And this package has to cater for those, those differences. And uh, I will not go into the details now, but perhaps later we, we can talk about it. If we move to the next slide, Nicola, um, I'll start by just going through the, through the details of the package now very quickly. Um, and this is about the single rule book. Now, up to now, EU rules on AML have been delivered via directives. And for those of you who don't know the difference between a directive and a regulation, a directive is a form of law in the EU that allows considerable discretion in terms of implementation at the level of the member states. So this discretion has been used. And so we have end up with a bit of a patchwork of different approaches to implementing the same rules. What we're proposing now with the regulation is that obliged entities, those entities covered by the regulation, will be subject to directly applicable and therefore more uniform rules in a range of, of important areas uh, which are listed here. And I draw particular attention to harmonized rules around consumer, customer due diligence, the harmonization of rules around beneficial ownership, etc. And of course, uh, the limit on um, large cash payments, which has attracted uh, some attention in some member states. It's a single rule book, but it's not meant to be a kind of one size fits all approach. So we know that AML supervision is primarily a risk based uh, activity. And to reflect that fact, member states will be able to be stricter in some of these areas than required in the regulation. So, for example, just an example, the limit on large cash payments. Some member states already have limits below 10,000 euros, and we will not be asking them to increase those limits to 10,000. Member states can set those limits anywhere below 10,000 that they see, see, they see fit. Uh, to the next slide. Um, 
Thank you. This is the directive I just fill out. So what we have left on the directive are ways to improve the operation of the system and the implementation of rules where harmonization or full harmonization is perhaps less appropriate or less meaningful. So the main novelties in this directive would be this, and I've listed them here, joint analysis by FIUs, supervisory colleges, more public oversight of so-called self-regulatory bodies, um, more power for the registers of beneficial ownership to actually check those who register that they are in fact the beneficial owner, and then some uh, some ideas on the interconnection of bank account registers. And, and sorry to interrupt, FIUs uh, is financial intelligence sorry. units, right? Yeah, I thought I said once, but I'll say it again. Financial intelligence units, Oops. you're right, FIUs. No, no, it's fine. My bad. You know, the commission is a place of acronyms, so you have to remind me that I'm, I'm not necessarily talking to my own. Next slide is on third country. This is a, you know, the, the AML regulation also covers our external approach on anti-money laundering, the so-called third country dimension of the regulation here. And there we're not being too radical, we're sort of evolving our approach. So we'll keep the main features, which is that we, we essentially replicate the FATF listing. So if you're FATF listed, sorry, if you're a financial action task force listed, uh, you will be listed for us with also the possibility for us to list member states on our own initiative. But what we will do is make our approach more granular so that we differentiate more between member states on that list. So we will, for example, replicate the black and gray list of the FATF. At the moment, we have only one list. We will also you know, look more carefully at you know, how we might graduate or modulate some of the, the measures that go along with listing in our case, which is enhanced due diligence on banks. And all of that will be managed more granularly, more uh, aggressively, let's say, by the AML, the Anti-Money Laundering Authority, when we have set it up. So um, the next slide then is just a few words on the authority itself. Uh, I mean, this is perhaps the, the most attractive or the most attention grabbing aspect of the reform, which is uh, always the case in Europe. There's to be a new institution, a new authority. It will become a sort of centerpiece of supervision, of an integrated supervision system, uh, which will consist of the authority at the center and the national authorities in a sort of hub and spokes framework. Direct supervision by the authority of the riskiest cross-border entities, we think, will close some of the loopholes in cross-border supervision in, in Europe. And at the same time, the authority will coordinate national supervisory authorities in their work and assist them in increasing the effectiveness, their effectiveness in enforcing the single rule book. So, I mean, the objective we have here is to end up with a more homogeneous, more high quality set of supervisory standards and approaches and risk assessment methodologies. And uh, we will have a total staff of about 250 when it's up and running at full tilt. And of this total, we expect around 100 will work on direct supervision and the rest will work on the policy side of the house. It will also coordinate, as I said, the supervisory actions of the non-financial sector. And so for this purpose, it will give it similar powers to we, that we already exist in another European body, which is the European Banking Authority. But we intend to walk before we run. So the main focus will be on the financial sector. But we are very much aware that money laundering is not confined in any way to the financial sector. It will have a range of tasks and powers, the authority, and it will have the right to involve uh, national authorities and bodies as it sees fit in those powers. What we will say, however, is that for, and here we kind of, we, we drew on previous models where we have given strong centers and we wanted this to have a strong center because for some of the supervisory decisions which have to be taken quickly or may be difficult to take, we thought there was a need to have expeditious, more effective and efficient decision-making. And so we've reflected that in, in the governance. So we have a sort of dual structure. We have a executive board which consists of a chair and five permanent members and they are the ones who will make these difficult urgent decisions with reference of course to the general board which will have all the member state authorities on it but the decisions will lay primarily with this executive board all the other work around policy and standards however will be taken by the general board which will consist of the executive board 
but we'll have representation from all of the, the member states uh, on that. I want to be clear that we're, we're not proposing in any way to sideline national authorities in this process. They will remain very important. I'm very conscious that money laundering is a local activity and anti-money laundering has a very strong uh, local dimension. So the, the national authorities will remain very much uh, active. There will be an integrated system. Direct supervision will be conducted a little bit like supervision in the single supervisory mechanism with joint teams involving the, the authority and people from the local authorities. As I said, the general board will be able to advise the executive board when it's making some of its decisions on obliged or on individual uh, entities. If I can go to the next slide, uh, which is one from last. Um, this is just to say very few words about the, the other regulation we have, which is a recast. It's a tidying up of, a, of our regulation on the transfers of funds to introduce an obligation for all private providers involved in crypto asset transfers to obtain, hold and share data on the originators and beneficiaries of the transfers of virtual or crypto assets that they operate. So on request, they will have to make these data available to appropriate authorities, but only, only for the purpose of preventing money laundering and terrorism financing. So these new rules, I think, will enhance the monitoring of crypto asset providers and ensure compliance with the, the relevant uh, measures called for in FATF uh, recommendations. And that was identified as a weakness we had left in the previous anti-money laundering directive, the fifth uh, directive. And then one last uh, slide, just to de finally deal with timelines. Uh, when it comes to implementation, of course, we rely on the member states and the European Parliament to actually uh, adopt the package. We have, however, as, ever, as usual, set them a fairly ambitious timeline. What we want, and I think ideally, the new authority would be already established at the beginning of 2023. So that would give a sort of 18 month uh, period to do the negotiations on the legislative acts. That would be to allow it to become able to conduct its, most of its activities by early 2024. So we need a year to get it up and, and running. And to... Direct supervision, however, we think we can only do in 2026. And that's because we will need time to actually put the single rule book in place. So everything will have to And Also, based on the rule book, the authority will have to develop standards against which it's going to do its supervision, etc. So we think 2026 is about the right time for direct supervision. And again, we follow here the model we followed with the SSM and the SRB, where they came into existence for a period before they assumed their full, their full duties in terms of supervision. So we will have this period of 2023 to 2026 to ensure that everything is in place for the authority to do its job uh, in terms of supervision properly. So these are the main features of the package. Uh, I mean, just to sum up, you know, the experience we've had in Europe, I think has revealed that the predominantly decentralized approach that we've had has not been fit for purpose. We've had too many, too many accidents, let's say. Um, given the way we're structured in the EU and given this decentralized structure, we, just, you know, we know that the strength of our arrangements are on, is only as good as the weakest link. So this is why we want more harmonization, more centralization, and we think it's needed. I would say this because I'm biased, but I think the package is pretty ambitious reform. I think it harmonizes and centralizes in a way and where it makes sense to do so, certainly today. And it also retains, as I said, this important local dimension that is very important uh, for anti-money laundering uh, activity. We think in our proposal, we found the right balances in the package, but of course it's now up to the member states and the European Parliament, so-called co-legislators, to decide what they want. And I will stop there and uh, thank you all for listening to my, I hope not too much longer than 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. And uh, indeed you gave us a lot to chew on. I forgot to say in the introduction, but it's not too late to say that uh, Josh is here, um, not representing the Bank of Hope. Uh, he does work at the same time for the, the German Marshall Fund. Uh, and uh, we see that in his background, but this is not uh, in any way to be construed or viewed as uh, representing his uh, commercial employer. Josh, over to you. Thank you, Nicola. Um, 
and thanks for inviting me and thanks for saving me 10 seconds of uh, throat clearing there. So um, I uh, enjoyed the presentation from John Berrigan and it makes it a little bit difficult for me because my job is maybe to poke holes or find things to criticize. I think that it's a very ambitious package and I don't have too many things to criticize. I can come up with maybe one and a half, but I want to start by saying that I think that the package really does, as John Berrigan just said, create an architecture that addresses pretty directly the structural problems that have been evinced over the last few years that I think led to some of the major uh, money laundering breakdowns in the European Union. Um, when looked at in the context of some of the other transparency measures that have been put in place in the EU really will make the EU, I would say, head and shoulders above all other jurisdictions in terms of, you know, a strong AML, anti-money laundering environment right now. Um, and so I think that this agency will be unique around the world in becoming a strong independent player for anti-money laundering supervision. There's not gonna be anything else like it. You have different models in different countries in which you have a conduct authority do anti-money laundering supervision or a prudential supervisor. Sometimes you have a financial intelligence unit do it. Uh, sometimes it's broken up functionally by credit or deposit taking institution versus securities. This is gonna be the strongest uh, player in the world. And therefore I think a leader, both in terms of aggressive enforcement, setting a good example and developing best, best practices within the European Union in terms of coordinating the national competent authorities. And I hope globally in leading to better coordination among supervisors. I think one of the problems we've seen globally is that there is um, a basic structure in place for coordination among financial intelligence units traditionally in support of law enforcement. And we don't have the same uh, in terms of supervisors on the anti-money laundering side. And I think that that is another potential uh, positive benefit or externality of this outside the European Union. Um, quickly on the context, I and mean, when you look at where the EU is, they're really gonna be beyond financial action task force standards here, beyond where the United States is. And not only will there be a strong independent centralized anti-money laundering supervisor, but we have to look at it in the broader context of the EU being a jurisdiction that is putting in place public beneficial ownership registries of companies, is putting in place a non-public bank account register, uh, and doing a variety of other measures on uh, transparency that will further buttress or strengthen this, this structure. Um, maybe we could talk more about that in the, in the Q&A. Um, if I were to try to criticize this proposal, which I think is ambitious and fit for purpose, it would be that there is some ambiguity around direct and indirect supervision. Um, I think that, you know, from my understanding, the, the single supervisory mechanism at the European Central Bank has done a good job of balancing that on the prudential side. I think there are two things to question here. First of all, what will indirect supervision look like? And if it's joint teams uh, on the direct side and very strong guidance on the indirect side where there's a lot of two-way flow of information, um, I think it could work very well. I think strong assertive indirect supervision is in some ways even better than direct supervision of everyone because it's not plausible for one authority in Brussels or wherever it may be to have its ear to the ground in every single, at every single regional institution around the European Union. So I think that indirect supervision, if it's tight and well-oiled and frictionless, actually is the superior way to, to go for smaller, or in this case, maybe less significant um, institutions. But of course, indirect supervision could also be very indirect, in which case it would not be uh, ideal. Then on the direct side, I think this is the one area I could criticize. Um, I think that the proposal to have objective criteria for determining who's under direct supervision or what we would call a, you know, a significant AML institution, to me seems a little bit um, awkward in that it is difficult to come up with quantitative or objective criteria for who poses the greatest anti-money laundering risk. I understand why from an architectural perspective, it makes sense to try to do that. And the, the uh, the, the regulation actually expressly says we will not give discretion to the authority to be subjective in this. I think ideally the authority would have discretion to be subjective because um, some of the elements laid out, and we'll see how this gets implemented in further rulemaking, some of the elements you know, would, 
would really limit who's under direct supervision and that you need to have a presence of a branch or subsidiary in a certain number of member states and you have to have like high risk activities in those states, et cetera. You know, I think you can have, a, as some of, the, some of the history has shown, you can have a lot of cross border risk in a small institution in one country. So I understand the reasons to do that, both uh, in terms of administrative bureaucratic reasons as well as political reasons. That to me is not how I would set it up. But first of all, it's important to establish the authority. And once it exists, you know, that, that, that's the battle. And once you have it, uh, those criteria can always be, you know, re-examined down the road and further refined. I would also note that there is sort of a catch-all provision in there that says separate from the objective criteria for who will be determined a, an entity subject to direct supervision, which is, I think, reviewed every three years. There is also the ability for, I believe it's the board, to, um, to nominate an institution that falls outside of those criteria based on a failure at the national level. So it's interesting to see how that plays out. I would say you'd really ideally want to try to capture institutions based on the anti-money laundering risk they pose, regardless of their size and scope of their cross-border activities and number of jurisdictions which they're active. But, you know, I think that there is scope there to try to capture the biggest offenders or biggest concentrations of risk over the years. And like, you need to give it time to, to play out. So that's the best I can do of criticizing. Um, I would want to put out one final um, uh, thought or reflection, which is that the architecture is strong and, and, and thoughtful and, you know, the authority is going to be there on the books, you know, the black letter of the law looks really good. Um, separate from those, you know, sort of regulatory determinations about who's subject to direct supervision and who's subject to indirect supervision is the element of, of, uh, of culture and, and practice. And, and I think, you know, leadership of this organization is going to be important. Political independence is going to be important. And assertiveness, independence, and sometimes even aggressive aggression is going to be important in that if we look at some of the failures in the past, you often had authority of national, the ability of national competent authorities to say, step in earlier, make a referral to the European Central Bank earlier, impose large fines or other restrictions earlier. They had legal authority, but they didn't do it for a number of political or other reasons. I think that by creating this independent authority, the EU does sort of address a lot of that underlying dynamic head on. However, a lot of it will come down to leadership. And, you know, I think that the Netherlands has been, the Dutch Central Bank has been unique in the European Union of being willing to impose really, really aggressive fines. And I don't want to say that good annual supervision is about only aggressive fines. I mean, it's not. There are a number of elements. A lot of what supervisors do is behind the scenes. It relates to uh, you know um, recommendations and orders to change business or compliance department. It relates to restrictions on growth, uh, you know, uh, overruling uh, acquisitions or change, qualifying holding changes, uh, management, uh, ownership changes. All those things are, are an important piece of the puzzle. But let's not you know understate the political dynamic. All those plus the fines. So I think that even if you have the perfect architecture and writing leadership matters a lot. And I think that it's likely this organization will get that because it's going to be far more independent from national governments and national industries or sectors than the existing uh, authorities are. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic on that, but I just wanted to emphasize that I think it goes beyond authority and to culture and leadership as well. Thanks, Josh. And uh, I don't know, uh, Sean, if you want to react on, uh, on the point that Josh just made, including, for example, on the scope of direct supervision and on this issue of uh, leadership. Yeah, and just just a very few uh, few remarks. I mean, first of all, thanks to Josh, it's it's encouraging to have such an expert say that there's not too much he has to criticize about the package. That's um, that's already a good thing. I think he's right. I, I mean, the package is largely driven by our own internal reflections about our own internal arrangements. But that being said, I think it will. It will become the interlocutor for other country uh, AML authorities, which of course has been a criticism in of the EU, the usual criticism that when you have a problem with the EU anti-money laundering arrangements, it was not always clear who you should call. We, the new authority will answer that question. It will be the authority that you will call and then 
will go on from there, uh, depending on what whether the entity is directly or indirectly supervised. I mean, there is ambiguity, yes, but that's because you can't, you know, it's not possible to eliminate ambiguity altogether. Um, I mean, somebody asks, I think, in, in the questions, why we just don't sideline the national authorities and go, go straight for a single entity that does everything. This is not to reflect the sort of very important local dimension to anti-money laundering activity. You have to interact. Unlike banking supervision, you have to interact with a set of actors which are very national. So you have to interact with those, the police force, for example. We, we don't have a single EU police force. They're all different. There are the criminal law system, all very different. So trying to operate an EU anti-money laundering framework uniquely from some town 2,000 kilometers away from where the entity is and where the entity is being you know, watched from other and handled from other dimensions doesn't make sense. So there has to be this balance between the activities undertaken at the center and those uh, at the uh, at the at, at the periphery but they have to be properly joined up so where does direct supervision come in well we have tried to frame it as josh said you know we can just give uh, an entity super uh, surprise entry total discretion that doesn't seem to work in the cases of other entities so we have learned our lesson that you know Typically, you start, and here I give an example of the, of the uh, resolution authority where we started with an entity with no particular framing in legislation, but then ultimately we had to introduce another review of legislation which gave some legal frame to what that entity does. So here we start from that position that pure discretion is not necessarily workable and we give it a degree of framing. But as, as he has pointed out, the authority does retain the right to go outside of that frame if it sees a very risky entity which is not being properly taken care of or, or cannot be properly taken care of at the domestic level. In a way, if I understand, sorry to interrupt, if I understand the, the proposal correctly, this can only happen when there has been a, a recognition of failure, right? Uh, so so the, the AMLA, the European Authority, cannot be proactive in that broadening of its scope. Am I correct? Not beyond what's framed, but I mean, if you look at the, and here Josh may disagree, but I think in the framing criteria we put down, we capture most cases. There will be some cases where they're not captured there and we still, the authority still wants to act and they will be covered by this, by this sort of catch-all phrase. But another area where obviously direct supervision becomes more the case is if you have complex cross-border uh, institutions where no individual national authority has a holistic picture of the, of the, of the whole, and there it makes perfect sense that the, the, the authority takes care of those kinds of, of entities. However, we were reluctant to put sort of size limits here because as Josh rightly says, and I think you have said in the past, uh, Nicola, you know, money laundering is not, you know, is not uniquely or even primarily taking place through the larger operations. They very often are the smaller operations that are the targets of these non-laundering operations. So setting some kind of size limit like we do in the case of the supervisory mechanism or the resolution mechanism where above a certain size they're automatically in, below a certain size they're automatically out, doesn't really work that well in the money laundering um, sphere. And therefore we have to have these criteria which are slightly, slightly different. And then the point on culture and practice, I take it 100%. I remember a long time ago when we were talking about the single supervisor in banking and I asked the question of somebody who's now very important in that world, what he thought the difference was between a single supervisor and single supervision. And he had at least five years. So, you know, just creating the supervisor is only creating the frame within which you build a common culture. But without it, of course, it's not possible to build that culture. So it's a really important step to have this authority where you have, and this is also why the national authorities have to be part of that authority, because you're not going to impose such a culture from the outside. You create that culture by having a strong center and having the, the local national authorities as part of that mechanism. And that's how you develop this common culture. Because 
clearly our anti-money laundering legislation has been pretty modern right? with we will not boast about it but it's by no means the worst in the world our problems have not been the legislation have not been the rules our problems have been the way in which the rules have been implemented and that's where i think we have to um, we have to tighten up this degree of national discretion in implementing the rules so hence scope or regulation or directly applicable rules and then create this authority which creates the right culture and the right framework for applying them consistently i think with the two things together you know you get a better outcome Bruce mentioned uh, location of the agency, he said Brussels or wherever. Um, this is not, unless I misread, uh, specified in the, in the proposal um, of uh, the Commission. Uh, can you uh, enlighten us on the process for that bit? Well, this is um, never something we put in our legislative proposals. That's always a decision left to the member states. Um, and this time will be no different. Now, since we have only uh, adopted the package on the 20th of July, we had one conversation with the member states, which was mainly just to give their initial reactions to the proposal, which I can tell you were all pretty, pretty positive. Uh, we're nowhere near discussing where, where the uh, authority should, uh, should go. And I hope, I very much hope that this doesn't become the sort of main talking point of the package. There's a lot of, you know, we always worry about this, that, you know, when you talk about the location of authorities, it somehow becomes the big issue and you miss the more important issues. So um, I think the member states will have to decide where they want to put it, but hopefully they'll decide that on the basis of what uh, the authority is expected to do. And hopefully they'll agree that what our package is the right one and then the decision should be fairly straightforward. Nance, do you have any advice on location? No, that, that would not be my, my forte. Um, but I, I think that, as John Berrigan just said, that, you know, I think there are a number of locations that could make sense. We also want to watch and see where developments are with Brexit and if there's some sort of, you know, shift to a financial center. Um, and um, I guess one thing I could say on location is if the goal of this authority is to really be holistic and look beyond um, depository or credit institutions, it doesn't, of course, that's going to be the, the core of the financial system. But it doesn't necessarily need to be where all the big banks are. If you know you have an emerging fintech payments hub, or an you know, for example, um, asset management and uh, investment funds are going to be under this authority, which is a huge advantage over the U.S., where we don't even have um, we don't even have anti money laundering requirements for private investment funds. But if you look around the world, you don't see a lot of enforcement action on the asset management or investment fund sector. Um, or on electronic payments companies for that matter. So I think that in some ways, putting that decision off a couple of years makes a lot of sense because let's see what develops uh, in the industry. But I mean, there are a number of places that could make sense because there are already a number of couple, couple of large banking hubs. So I'm sure all of those come to mind, but you know, uh, I, I don't have an opinion. So we, we spent some time already on the supervisory model and the architecture and the relationship between the AMLA and the local authorities. Uh, but I have a, an additional question. Actually, there are several questions already in the Q&A about this, Laurent Mich Milischer and Jack Schickler. Essentially, I ask, you know, why, why do you need to keep the national uh, authorities at all? And you gave an argument of being close to the ground, but that could be done by offices or local, you know, uh, outlets of the AMLA. It doesn't have to be a separate national authority under its own uh, framework for accountability and, uh, you know, appointment of executives and all that. So uh, can you elaborate a bit on that? And uh, especially if there is a situation in which, pardon my language, uh, the national authority is hopeless and there is basically no trust between AMLA and the national uh, supervisor, uh, how far can the AMLA go in terms of, if you uh, allow me to put it in these terms, uh, take the reins? I suppose I would probably turn that question around and say, okay, why keep them in? Why, why put them out? I mean, if you think of the banking supervisory model, as I said, in which we, we, had, we were inspired to some extent, um, it works extremely well. You, you have the SSM. It has a fairly a much larger number of people uh, at the center, but it still works through the national authority. And this works quite well with, with joint team. So, you know, you ask me why put them out, why, why keep them in? I ask the question, why put them out? 
if there is, of course, as you said, the case of lack of trust or a failure of capacity or whatever, then the legislation allows the authority to take even a relatively small, perhaps obscure bank under a national uh, supervision under its, under its wing. So this, I think, is the best balance. As I said, these are all about getting balances. And I think the best balance is to try to maximize the benefits of having national knowledge and national interaction with having a strong center, with always the option of the center taking direct control if that is the most appropriate uh, response. But it should not be the false response. I think it would be very difficult to operate this thing from um, you know, all of it from a, from a center that can be thousands of kilometers away from, from the bank involved. And even with local offices, you will still need you know, local knowledge, I think. And I think- so I have questions uh, from the audience about the linkage between um, money laundering and, uh, and AML policy as uh, will also be um, conducted by the new authority and tax enforcement, especially in the current context of discussions at the OECD, uh, cooperation with the US. So I'd like to ask both of you on how to think about those linkages and whether uh, specifically the strengthening of the AML supervisory framework in Europe will uh, help uh, get uh, to a better place in terms of tax en enforcement and the fight against tax evasion, Sean. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I think it will, but it, well, it's not the objective of the, uh, of, of the exercise. I mean, as I said at the beginning, the objective of the exercise has been to respond to vulnerabilities identified in the anti-money laundering arrangements. Okay, we, we, we had this series of episodes, a series of scandals, let's be blunt, uh, which we had to address because the, you know, the, the reputational damage to the system as a whole was very high and it was, uh, we, we identified weaknesses. So we needed to strengthen every link of the chain and that's what we're addressing. Will it help in terms of tax evasion? Well, to the extent that you have one central authority where information can be centralized, it would suggest that the interactions then with, but again, with, with national tax authorities will be improved and that could, could help. But I stress again, this is, a, this is a package aimed primarily within the financial sector at a particular issue within the financial sector and not just, but within the anti-money laundering discussion. It's not really, we didn't set out to achieve particular objectives around tax evasion, but they are very closely linked as you know, the two policies uh, DG taxation is across the road from me here. Um, you know, we, we work quite closely on both of these policies because there are close links between them, both internally, but also in, in, in the external side. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's exactly right. And we can think of these as distinct policy objectives with distinct rules and differentiated you know, methods of enforcement that are overlapping controls and very much speak to one another. So as John Berrigan just said, good anti-money laundering uh, supervisory environment can help reinforce good tax enforcement um, because if one uncovers suspicious activity or undeclared flows, that could of course be turned over to the tax authorities. But I, so this will certainly help with that. But it also works the other way. So um, some of the transparency measures being pursued in the name of better tax enforcement will also help strengthen anti money laundering enforcement. So. John Bergen didn't even present this among the, you know, in the robust uh, package of proposals from FISMA, but separate from all, everything he just presented in the PowerPoint uh, deck, FISMA just put out um, a tender for the study of the creation of a European Union wide asset registry, which I think we could think of as the brainchild of the new director of the EU tax observatory, Gabriel Zuckman. Um, the observatory set up in Paris this year, which is going to try to improve tax enforcement across the EU, particularly that of multinational corporations. So, you know, an asset register, of course, is a game changer for tax enforcement. Um, but at the same time, it would have positive benefits for anti-money laundering, law enforcement, and also national security considerations uh, in terms of who owns what and tracking foreign investment and foreign investment screening, which is even beyond the scope of this discussion. So these things definitely are symbiotic and talk to one another, and I think can be thought of as sort of overlapping macro controls. Um, but, you know, AML supervision is not primarily about trying to suss out, you know, tax avoidance or tax evasion, but sometimes, of course, it, it, it pops up. 
So, so a number of questions, perhaps inevitably, inevitably about crypto, and we have questions about that from Greg Smith and Doug Redeker, and uh, also indir indirectly David Wright, who is one of your predecessors in the job, uh, Shen. Uh, so, and 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 uh, Greg Smith is asking also something along the lines of. You know, if big tech takes finance to tax havens anyway, uh, what can this new authority do? I mean, uh, in uh, in a jurisdiction like the European Union, which is committed to not having external capital controls, um, how much are you just pushing um, uh, illicit activity or harmful activity outside of the system in a way that the new framework will not be able to control? What, what is the response to that? Well, maybe I'll, I'll make a general point first that leaving crypto aside for a minute, the point has been made to us, of course, that as we tighten up our control of money laundering in the financial sector, the risk is that we just, as you said, force it into non-financial sectors. Let's take that point first. This is why I've been clear the, 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 the future vocation of the authority is not going to be confined to the financial sector. I mean, we are well aware that there are other sectors which will make the authority a very different animal from, let's say, the supervisory, the bank supervisory authority. Okay, this at the moment when it starts, it'll be doing mainly financial, but eventually it will move into areas like casinos and, and you know, the legal profession and all sorts of areas which are very much outside of the financial. So over time, I yeah, think we have we have a question actually from one attendee about art and real estate. So that will be included eventually as well, right? Yes, I mean we will extend out to that. So over time, this authority is going to become a bit. A lot different, let's say, from what the SSM looks like today, but it's still inspired by the by the basic model. In terms of crypto, I mean, we have to distinguish what what we are doing here now. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, let me continue. That if it's crypto and they and they move it to third countries, that's why, you know, as I said, this is designed to address our um, our package is designed to address internal failings, but we also have our eye on the external side. So we, we do have third country regimes. If we think some of those regimes are not behaving well in terms of money laundering, even if the Fed app doesn't spot them or doesn't choose to, we have the right to choose as well. So we have retained the right to, on our own initiative, include on our list um, a, a, a jurisdiction that we think is deficient in terms of its money laundering frame, anti-money laundering framework. And of course, as you know, unlike the Fed app list, going on the EU list, there's a consequence. The consequence being that our banks have to do enhanced due diligence on any transactions going to or from our, our entities, not just our banks, have to do enhanced due diligence. So am I saying it's perfect? No, but I am saying that you know the package covers both sides. And so if it tries to move outside the financial sector, we will eventually extend to that. And if it tries to move outside the union, we will have to work both ourselves directly, but also through the FATF more generally in, um, in enhancing. Because I think beyond what we're talking about here, there is a global need to enhance the way we are approaching um, anti-money laundering. And that has to be done through the FATF. And of course, having the a kind of single EU authority in that will also be important in you know, pushing a bit of, of ambition together with the US and others in, in that global agenda as well. But I'm not gonna sit here today and pretend that because we have this new framework money laundering will cease to exist uh, from 2026. It's not the case. These are just steps in, in the right direction. Crypto, we came back, as I said, we, we actually covered quite a lot of crypto to, to non-crypto transactions in the AMLD5. So they were all captured. What we did not capture were these uh, crypto to crypto transactions through asset providers. And that's why we came back with the transfer of funds regulation, tightened that up. So again, we're doing our best to, to tackle the crypto situation as we know it today. But as Josh rightly said, uh, this, is a, this is a world that's changing very, very quickly. So um, no, this will not be the end of the story in, in terms of crypto. Um, I think the EU is in a very similar place that the United States is with crypto, clarifying that requirements go beyond the crypto exchange um, and that AML requirements do apply to service providers under their jurisdictions. And I think that while there's a lot of change, uh, technological change right now and some regulatory ambiguity, I think in the medium term, the ability of cryptocurrency to evade government regulation will prove to be overstated. 
and I, I don't think that that will last long. Okay, that's pretty uh, definitive. Uh, there's a question uh, from uh, Timothy Smith on um, a topic that Josh knows very well. Uh, has any thought been given to introduce to including a Patriot Act Section 311 type targeting mechanism directed towards specific institutions outside the EU beyond just targeting entire jurisdictions? So, uh, uh, so Patriot Act Section 311 is the one with which the US uh, uh, government can point its uh, laser beam to a bank anywhere in the world and kill it instantly, uh, as it did, for example, with uh, um, ABLV in, uh, in Latvia a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, Josh uh, uh, has been involved in some of those cases. I don't know if, Josh, you want to make a comment before I hand it over to Sean? I'm very, I'm very curious what... Uh... What the answer is going to be, although I suspect it will involve, that would not be a competency of DG FISMA. Um, I think that, 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 you know, when you get into foreign policy and national security, the EU is in a different place in the United States, and it's harder for it to act in that way. We can see that the EU definitely does have a unified sanctions regime. Uh, it is not deployed nearly as aggressively as U.S. sanctions, so I think a similar dynamic would pertain on 311, uh, well, on a Section 311 style anti-money laundering or money laundering targeting authorities, targeting third country banks. Um, I think that it's a longer discussion, but Section 311 has not been used uh, in the way that sanctions authorities are. It's proven hard for the U.S. to use and is a challenging authority, um, but I think an important tool in the arsenal, and it would be quite important if the EU adopted something like that, although I don't know if it ever would. I'm curious what uh, John Berrigan would say about that. Um, well, what I'll say is that so we've been very careful, and uh, particularly in our conversation with third country jurisdictions, to be clear that nothing in this package is extraterritorial, okay? Because so, in some cases, the fact that we imply enhanced due diligence has been, we have been accused of being extraterritorial, but actually we're not, because we are not applying any requirements to the jurisdiction that we identify. We apply our additional due diligence requirements to banks inside and operating in the Union, European, established in the European Union. Why is that? Because the logic of our anti-money laundering framework is to protect the single market, to protect the single financial market from external problems. So we're not trying to uh, you know, reach out and impose restrictions on individual entities inside other jurisdictions. We are simply saying that if we think a jurisdiction has a framework which is deficient, we require our entities to double up, triple up, whatever, their due diligence in dealing with entities that are operating from that jurisdiction. In that way, we're able to, we think, to achieve the effect we want, which is to protect the single market without uh, being extraterritorial. We've had enough um, issues of our own with extraterritoriality in other areas and not to want to get into that. So it has not really been uh, considered in, in this package uh, Quite the contrary, we were trying to be, reassure our external uh, interlocutors that there is not an extraterritorial uh, dimension, even if perhaps for them the effect feels a bit the same. Um, we, do not, we do not stretch out beyond the jurisdiction of the Union into other jurisdictions. We do have a sanction. Some questions. Uh, sorry, uh, no, no, did no, you want ahead. to add something? No, I was uh, we we got some, se several questions about cooperation and information sharing. So jo Johanna uh, Ort is asking, um, you know, uh, about information sharing be between banks, for example, under the auspices of uh, a PPP. Uh, the, and I'm not sure what PPP stands for in that particular acronym. Uh, the, the package uh, allows this if it concerns the same customer and the same transaction, but will this be enough to enable efficient information sharing? From a bank's perspective, these criteria seem quite restrictive. Have you considered to skip the same customer customer criterion? Uh, also, Daniel van den Ham is asking if you can elaborate a bit with uh, on the cooperation between Europol and the new authorities, the AMLA, uh, how it will look like given the current role that Europol uh, has towards the financial information units of the different member states. And uh, last but not least, David Wright uh, is asking about the technology aspect of this and data protection aspect. Uh, he uh, asked whether the relevant data will be able to be exchanged and transferred with the EU's data protection rules and all the apparatus that we have now for privacy. So if you, I know these questions are different from one another, but if you can kind of bundle them uh, in, uh, in your response, Sean. 
uh, okay, I can go. I was bundled in. Um, I, I think we we have considered going further than this this idea of the same customer. But again, as I said, it's all been about a balance. Um, and, and we we and her, I actually Joanna's second question talks about getting things through the council and the European Parliament negotiations. This is all about part of the balance. Okay, so we have to start with this authority. And I think, as Josh himself said, what's important is you get the authority up and running and then it develops its own credibility, its own reputation, and then we will build going forward. We'll see what works and what does not. But as an opening proposition, we think we've got the balance right there, even if some people think that we don't. And PPP, I assume, means public-private partnerships, but uh, I, Joanna can correct me if I'm wrong. On the relationship between AMLA and Europol, the first thing to state is that AMLA or AMLA, the new, the new authority, is not going to be an FIU. Okay? It is not going to be that. How the AMLA will interact with the FIU is that it will provide a mechanism within which the FIUs can coordinate. So there will be two boards. So it's going to have quite a, an additional complexity in its structure. So as well as having the supervisory board, it's going to have this FIU board, which will be different, different people. But this will be the first steps, I mean, I, we were talking before we came on, Nicola, about why no EU FIU. You know, this is not the right moment to talk about an EU FIU. Perhaps in the future, yes, but this is not the right moment. The moment now is to get more cooperation, get more cross-border interaction between these uh, intelligence units, which is already not bad, but could be better. And we think the AMLA will provide that, that mechanism. So in that sense, of course, Europol will deal to some extent with the AMLA to the extent that the AMLA is this coordination mechanism, but they will continue to have direct relationships with national FIUs because the bulk of uh, FIU activity will remain uh, in, with the national FIUs. And then on the GDPR, well, of course, David wasn't wasn't around when I was doing all this work with the uh, with the SEC and the issues we had with US access to supervisory data. The GDPR is something that is, you know, there are provisions in the GDPR which are actually explicitly say this is not getting the way of, of managing uh, the, the fight against crime or the fight against uh, financial uh, mismanagement or put in doubt stability, etc. So there is a need to articulate all of that but it's only a matter of articulation. So typically with the right sort of, um, with the right uh, preparation, the GDPR becomes quite, uh, it's, it does not become an, an obstacle to the transfer of information. We just have to get the right articulation. And that's correct by the way, because in areas like financial supervision and also I guess in money laundering, we have over the years just assumed that we can have whatever data we like because we claim there's a stability risk or we claim there's a criminal risk or whatever. What the GDPR says is, yeah, that's fine if there is a criminal, if you can kind of demonstrate that risk. And that's all that's required is to demonstrate the risk and then the GDPR becomes relatively um, permissive in terms of data transfer. On this issue of information exchange, uh, I mean, obviously one aspect of it is information exchange between the authorities in the EU uh, in the US and also uh, the UK and other jurisdictions, but particularly in the transatlantic context, do you think that assuming the package gets adopted, uh, that will have an impact on information exchanges uh, between authorities uh, across the Atlantic? Um, well, you're, you're asking me to look very far in the future. I, I imagine having a single authority which has access to data will make it operationally more convenient, more efficient, to have such exchanges. Okay? Where there may be issues, of course, that's where the GDPR comes back in again, um, you know, to the extent that our frameworks for data privacy may be different, it doesn't matter what sort of authority you put in place in the EU, they will, they will remain. But I think from an operational efficiency, given that the, it is possible to exchange data, having two large entities coordinating that information should make it easier. Once you've been in charge of that operationally, how do you think it will have an impact? How do I think what would have an impact? Privacy rules? No, just generally the creation of this uh, European authority and uh, more generally the commission package, uh, will it improve or make uh, information exchange across the Atlantic uh, more difficult? Oh, across the Atlantic? No, I think it would make it much better as I tried to allude to at the outset. I think that, you know, there isn't really, a, so you have the, uh, 
Egmont group for financial intelligence units, which can to some extent help facilitate information sharing among financial intelligence units. Probably more importantly, you have you know, international legal framework for exchange of information uh, between law enforcement agencies or, um, or uh, justice ministries and prosecutors of the mutual legal assistance treaty requests. The missing, and so, you know, you could think of financial intelligence unit information as more like lower scored kind of lead information and then an, M, an MLAT request, a mutual legal assistance treaty is a, is a higher threshold, let's say. But the missing piece is there isn't really a framework in place, either institutionally or legally, for sharing of information, AML supervisory information, anti-money laundering problems encountered by one supervisor don't really have a natural channel to flow to the other supervisor when there's cross-border issues. So I think that by centralizing this within the European Union and by becoming a central point of contact for the European Union, it will definitely facilitate information sharing um, with the United States, for example, and probably other important jurisdictions. The problem for the European Union is going to be that there, or for this new agency, there still isn't a central point of contact on the American side because we have a very fragmented AML supervision system. So that will not solve this. Problem. So we're at the hour, uh, but I have a final question and it's for you, Josh. Um, we have seen the sizing of the new authority uh, with 250 people uh, when it's up and running after the transition period. Uh, will that be enough? Well, when I was trying to think of things to criticize, I also thought maybe I could criticize that, but I wasn't confident that I could. But since you've provoked me, um, it, I was trying to do some back of the envelope math, you know, as okay, how many people would you need? And I concluded that I didn't know. However, I think I can say that a standalone dedicated, you know, cross-functional anti-money laundering supervisor of 250 people for the common market is a very good place to start. As John Berrigan alluded to, you know, you start with policy and, and sort of like a supervisory handbook, uh, and then you move into direct supervision and of, of banks and then other financial institutions, then potentially you move into more indirect supervision, not only of financial institutions, but other obliged entities up to and including non-financial sectors, right? Depending how many of those it, it encompasses and how many, let's say, institutions are brought under direct supervision over the years, I think it might eventually need to grow, but it's nothing to sneeze at. Um, I think it's a very reasonable starting point, but the logic of, the, if this model works, and I hope it will, I think the end point in 10 years um, would probably be more than 200 people. Um, I, I tried to do back of the envelope math comparing to the US, because we could say that the US financial system is about the same size as the European financial system, but it's very hard to say. So, I mean, you know, because we have a fragmented system, I won't bore the listeners, I couldn't come up with an apples to apples comparison. The largest bank supervisor in the US, the most important one uh, in terms of number of organizations of size that are examined is the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. We also have others, including the FDIC and then the Federal Reserve, there's a lot of large banks. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency has over 3,000 employees uh, and it's not a policy making organization, it's simply supervision, but the majority of that is safety and soundness and prudential. So I could not come up with any kind of comparison, but I think that 250 is a reasonable starting point, not, a, not an end. Thanks so much. Thanks to Sean Bergen. Thanks to Josh Kirschenbaum. Uh, this session certainly gave us a lot of thought and I hope it will give some uh, input also to the legislators, the co-legislators, which will now have to work on uh, the Commission's proposal. Uh, and with that, uh, on that hopeful note, um, I, it's my pleasure to end the session and again to express my gratitude to our two speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.